Hi everyone, it's Judy. Welcome back to the On Track Podcast. Today we talk to Nathan Tracy and Justin Pickle from TE Connectivity and how they're feverishly paving the way to, are you ready for it, 100 gigabits per second data rates. They're gonna talk about how this is gonna affect the way you design as well as the whole infrastructure of our industry. I think you're gonna enjoy this one. So get ready to drink from the fire hose. See you on the other side. Welcome to All Team's On Track Podcast, where we talk to leaders about PCB design, tackling subjects ranging from schematic capture all the way to the manufacturing floor. I'm your host, Judy Warner. Please listen in every week and subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, and all your favorite podcast apps. And be sure to check out the show notes at altium.com forward slash podcast, where you can find great resources and multiple ways to connect with us on social media. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today on the On Track Podcast. We're delighted to have you. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks, Judy. Thanks, Judy. Great to be here. So um, why don't you uh, two start out by introducing yourselves and telling us a little bit about each of your roles at TE. And uh, Justin, why don't we start with you? Sure. So I've worked at TE about 11 years now. I work in our data and devices um, high-speed development group. We develop, um, as a development engineer, I develop a lot of the high-speed products, both connectors and cables. Um, that we use in the data center market. And I'm Nathan Tracy. I'm a technologist on our system architecture team, and I'm responsible for managing our industry standards efforts as well, having been here at TE for an embarrassing 38 years. Wow, look at you. So Nathan, given your tenure at TE Connectivity, can you give us a a thumbnail sketch of TE Connectivity and, and what the company does? Sure. So TE is a large global corporation. We've been around for over 75 years. Uh, currently, we're about a 13 to 14 billion dollar business. Um, just to give you an idea of the scope of product that we produce, we currently ship over 220 billion products per year. Wow. So we make a lot of product, and the product that we make is uh, connectivity and sensor solutions for high speed ruggedized um, uh, consumer for all types of different markets and so just to give you an idea some of the markets that we serve include the data and devices uh, market and that's where Justin and I are uh, but also uh, uh, appliances the appliance industry industrial aerospace defense and marine industry medical uh, energy uh, uh, area Uh, automotive is a very key market for TE industrial and commercial transportation as well. So that's all your trucks and your heavy equipment. Uh, I mentioned the sensor business that we have, and this is all a range of sensors, temperature, pressures, all types of product that, um, you know, goes into things, for example, like your Fitbit, but also uh, very uh, life critical applications as well. And then we have an application tooling business as well, where we develop tooling that serves our customers in their application of our product onto their systems. So it's a a very diverse company. It's electrical connectivity that touches virtually anything that anyone does in the course of their day. We're recognized truly as a global innovation leader. People look to us to be leaders in uh, technology development. And um, just to give you an idea, we currently hold about 15,000 patents and uh, 8,000 engineers globally distributed around the world. So it's a huge engineering workforce. Um, Within the business unit that uh, Justin and I serve, we call it data and devices. It's about a $1 billion business. And we serve the global communications industry. So we develop connectivity solutions for anything that supports the connectivity industry. Uh, including service providers like your telecom service providers, but cloud operators like your your large cloud operators, data centers, business equipment, even some consumer product as well. And and just to give us kind of a launching point, the focus of our discussion today is going to be on the high speed aspect of this data and devices business unit. Well, you you two have been teaching me. I mean. I- 
I imagine that high speed data was an issue, but um, as we prepared for this podcast, um, some of the things you shared with me were, were kind of took my breath away. So, um, Nathan, what is driving um, these massive increased data rates? Um, you mentioned the cloud and, and network um, servers and things like that, but what's what's driving this and kind of what's the speed of the uptick that you're seeing in these kind of uber fast speeds? Okay, so Judy, just to give you an idea, um, if we look back to about 2014, not that long ago, only mm -hmm. a few years ago, mm -hmm. and at that time, most of the high-speed connectivity that was happening was based on electrical interfaces operating at 10 gigabits per second. Okay. Uh, in 2014, that same year is when the industry standardized 25 gigabits per second. So that was a major leap wow. forward. So since that time in 2014, we the industry is now standardized 50 gigabits per second. That was in 2018, and now we're uh, the industry is currently in the in the process of tackling the problem of 100 gigabits per second, and we estimate that that'll be launched into the market in about 2021. So from that 2014 till now, we've gone from 10 gigabits to now uh, worrying about how we're going to do 100 gigabits and why. The question is why. Yeah. Why is uh, the data rate increasing so much? And it's the way that the people are finding to use data. You know, they refer to killer apps. And so just to, to help uh, baseline the conversation, I, I grabbed a few statistics. So comparing 2017 to 2022, and I'm going to give you a lot of numbers, but the number of users on the IP network is going to go from 3.4 billion to 4.8 billion. So a huge increase in users. Mm -hmm. The number of, of devices and connections that are going to be on that global network is going to grow from 18 billion to 28 billion over that period of time. And then the speeds, the average speed per user is going to going to double from 39 megabits per second today on average to about 75 megabits per second. And then the big driver, of course, is video. So video okay. viewing today represents about 75% of all the traffic, and it's going to represent 82% of the traffic by the time we get into that 2022 time frame. And it, it just is a, a mammoth amount of data. It's hard for people to comprehend. They talk about this time frame of 2022 is where we're going to enter the zettabyte era. So if you're not familiar with what a uh -huh. zettabyte is, it's one trillion gigabytes. And gigabytes are a lot. You know, you don't even have that at your home. So it's a one followed with 21 zeros. Oh, my god! So gosh. that's how many bytes are going to be going through the, the global network by the time we get to 2022. So when we talk about service providers and, and cloud operators, they're the ones that have to provide the underpinning for all of that traffic. And um, it's really this drive to more and more data. Um, and so, you know, some of the things that are changing are the, the types of data. So when we look to the future, we're going to have a lot of machine to machine data. And that's yeah. all going to be on that same network. So today you have the soda machine here at TE that has a little antenna and it tells the company, the soda company, when the machine is empty, it's time to bring more. But increasingly, we're all going to have our Fitbit watches on. We're all going to have devices throughout our home. And it's just this all this machine-to-machine -machine data that's going to come along. And then the, the growth in video, we talked about that. But it's not just the video we watch today. It's going to be 4K video. So by 2022, most of the video will be ultra-high resolution. And that's going to drive a lot more bandwidth. Um, and so... To, to kind of summarize, if we just think about our cell phone bill, if we looked at what it looked like four or five years ago versus today, mm -hmm. the amount of traffic that we're putting over just our cell phone. So now think about the number of connections that each one of us has within our home, within our workplace, and the new ways that we're using each one of those connections, video, machine to machine, um, all, the, all this talk of autonomous cars. It's not here yet, but it's coming and all those cars are gonna to talk to the network. They're gonna to talk to signposts along the highway. Those signposts are all connected to the network. And so there's no end in sight for the, the growth in data that we're gonna to have to come up with. And it, and it 
you know, we're kind of the foundational piece as, as the connectivity part of it. And then we provide that higher bandwidth solution to our customers that are making servers, routers, switches, optical transport, storage devices. They're putting those connectors in there to enable higher data rates. So they're constantly swapping out the equipment in the data center from what they had yesterday to what they need today to support this growth in data. And that's really what's driving um, okay. You know, poor Justin in terms of <laughs> the, the kinds of technology solutions that he needs to figure out how to embed into our product. How is, um, and I'm assuming that AI and machine learning is lumped into this category as well, because that requires a ton of data as well, right? Yeah, so it changes the way that the data center operates. Um the way the data center solves problems. So an inquiry comes into the data center, you wanna know what movie is gonna be showing tonight, and that goes into the data center and it comes right back to you. And the, But the problems that we're now asking the data center to solve are becoming much more complex and they're using AI to solve those. Hmm. And so now the compute engine that tells you what time the movie, now that compute engine is a compute but also augmented by the AI silicon as well. So now we have two types of silicon operating in the data center, both solving compute problems, but they're solving them different ways, different solutions for different problems. For your the, the case of your movie inquiry, you know that's probably going to stay on a simple uh, you know server type of problem solve. But then for other problems, it's going to go to AI, and that's where you know you're trying to choose. Um, what color clothing to order online and it's actually showing you different colors and it's choosing the you know it's 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 that ai that's now thinking for you so yeah it does and and so it means that we can do more things on the network because it's powered by ai and so that brings more traffic yeah. so the problem only just keeps to growing and growing right so justin what does this do to your life what kind of technological challenges does this put on your desk every day? Sure. It, it definitely puts um, a really large breadth of problems because, as Nathan says, we're not only increasing speed, as we increase bandwidth, we also have to increase density. So what we're seeing is a really high demand for not only higher speed products that have to function with a higher frequency and send more data per unit of time. We also have to pack more channels, more systems, and more um, actual bit streams into the same space. So really the problem is twofold, both higher density and more channels as well as higher speed. My gosh. So it really guys. is a twofold problem. So um, I think that Nathan, you had you well you just mentioned early in this conversation that where where you're aiming at right now is a hundred um, gigabits per second. So what makes that particularly hard? So when we increase the data rate, we're, so we're talking about an electrical signal and it's traveling through some type of metallic, generally a copper-based medium, and it might be our connector or it might be a printed circuit board, it might be a copper cable. Um, but as that signal uh, goes to higher and higher data rates, so we, we uh, develop a sens new sensitivities to impairment or degradation of that signal. Mm. Uh, one of the significant ones is the loss. So we talk about insertion loss, it's how far you can send the signal before it's lost. It, the, the signal just doesn't show up anymore. And that's critical to our customers because they have standard sized equipment. The electrons need to get from this active device to that active device. They're doing it through our connectors, they're doing it through copper traces, and they can't go as far as they used to. Within that um, connector, within that printed circuit board, there's uh, transitions that we make where we go from the connector to the printed circuit board or we, or we go from one layer of the printed circuit board to another layer of the printed circuit board. And those transition structures increase in loss, but they also can introduce reflections. So we talked about losing signal just because of attenuation, but now we're losing signal because it's being reflected back and mm -hmm. it's not making it to its destination. So mm -hmm. we, reflections become more sensitive, more critical uh, as we go to higher data rates. 
And then that limits the reach even further. And again, as I said, reach is a pretty big deal. As we go to higher data rates, another problem is we get crosstalk. So we have multiple channels and each channel is you know, sending data, but they're sitting side by side with each mm. other. And so one is creating some noise on the other, like when Justin and I both try and talk at the same time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that crosstalk degrades the signal further yet. You can't detect the transmitted signal because there's crosstalk noise that's kind of masking it or hiding it. And so, and, and then the last thing that we're dealing with, and, and Justin mentioned it, and that's density. As we go to higher data rates, not only does the data rate go up, but the silicon providers are increasing the number of transmitters and receivers that they can put into a device. And so from a connectivity standpoint, now we have to go to higher density. Higher density, bad news, that's going to create more crosstalk, again, further working against us. So. We went from 25 gig, we thought that was insanely hard. We (laughs) went to 50 gig, and to do that, we changed modulations so that um, it it brought new challenges for us, but it meant that the baud rate didn't have to increase that much. Now we're going from 50 gig to 100 gig, and so we're doing a combination of increasing the rate, but also increasing the modulation complexity. And so again, it all creates more challenges for Justin in terms of how these things are going to be realized. We need to find ways to overcome the, the loss, minimize the reflections, and, and minimize the crosstalk. And that's really the environment that we're in right now with 100 gig is trying to ad- address all of that. Piece of cake. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Justin, you know, obviously here our audience is it comprised largely of hardware engineers, EEs, PCB designers. What does this do at the PCB level? Yeah, so that's a really great question. You know, um, at the PCB level, if we think about how a typical system's kind of constructed, you might say at one end, you always have a chip. You have an active device that's sending a signal. And generally outside of that chip, the first thing that signal's going to see is your printed circuit board trace, right? Mm -hmm. And so Nathan did a great job talking about reach. And so for certain, that trace itself is something with some significant electrical length. And, you know, although copper is a pretty great conductor, probably one of the best ones we can find today, um, we still see that the actual printed material itself is fairly lossy. And so in the past, in 10 gig and below, we saw a lot of phenolic FR4-based materials that actually were used to comprise the many layers that we would stack up. Mm -hmm. Um, Recently, we've really had a lot of trouble with loss at these higher data rates, so we've seen migration to different laminate materials itself, as well as smoother copper. Um, The industry has recently learned a lot about copper roughness and the trade-offs between roughness, manufacturability, and loss itself. And so we've seen not only better materials, but also smoother copper, which creates lower loss PCB traces. At the other end of that trace, Nathan talked about vias and transitions. Generally, that trace is going to hit some sort of um, transition from the trace itself to either a surface pad that might might have a connector on it. It might be a via that you'd have a press fit pin inside. And what we find is that all of these structures need a very high degree of optimization to control the electrical impacts of them. For example, vias, you know, we have a significant trend in the market towards smaller and smaller via holes. Mm -hmm. As we get larger and larger, we find that the structure themselves is both electrically low in impedance, which creates extra reflections, as well as electrically noisy and creates crosstalk. So we've seen a really large trend towards smaller and smaller vias that miniaturize really the size of that transition. And that also speaks to density, you know, and so there's this delicate trade-off between more and more channels, smaller and smaller size, and at the same time trying to optimize and improve the performance of those vias themselves. With that has come, you know, a variety of technologies to try and improve the actual, what we call the connector footprint or a via. And then on top of that, you know, the via itself probably connects to some sort of either a connector or a cable or a cable assembly. And so outside of the connector, we see changes in PCB connection technology, where we transition from the PCB, whether it be a via or a pad, actually into the connector itself. And so really you have a couple different really areas of impact to address at the PCB level. 
And the level that we're doing it now is, you know, far beyond what we've seen at much slower data rates. So are you working more on high-speed materials now? I assume we're long past FR4 and moving into, you know, the the Rogers or, you know, these kind of high-speed materials that are, are lower loss and that also offer things like ro- rolled annealed copper or reverse treated foil so you 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 can address the skin effect and all that are you you're sure. dipping your toe i i not probably dipping i think you're swimming in it probably <laughs> for sure um we definitely do a lot of work to understand how we can interlock different technologies on the pcb side we don't develop our own laminates but we certainly understand the market trends that we see in laminates and how we can utilize the advantages of materials to provide higher density and higher performing interconnects you know with this higher speed requirement um, we've also seen, as Nathan touched on, hot, different modulation techniques. So that's required us with higher speed to not only push the bandwidth at which a device functions electrically, but also require an even lower crosstalk profile as we see tri- modulation techniques move from PAM2 or NRZ, where we're just sending zeros and ones, to a PAM4 modulation, where we're sending one, two, three, four. And mm. so the actual voltage level difference between a two and a three is now smaller than a zero and a one in the old days for Excellent. equivalent power. So all of these things kind of work together to crop to require a lot of optimization at the PCB level. Interesting. So Nathan, given all these almost they almost sound insurmountable challenges, you know, as you move towards a hundred gig, what what specific things is T E looking at to be able to address these, right? So, as I mentioned in the very beginning, the the industry looks to us to be a technology leader, and that means that we constantly have to be upping our game, uh, both in terms of the human resources that we have here and and their knowledge and their skill set, but also the tools that we use. And so we don't solve this problem entirely on our own. Uh, We have an industry of ecosystem partners that are here with us, whether it's um, companies that provide board layout tools, uh, powerful signal integrity modeling tools that we use, um, working with various board houses where they are improving their process from the standpoint of you know reducing the VSIs that Justin talked about, but also their ability to hit tighter tolerances, to use smoother foils, to um, uh, improve the tolerance of the layer, to understand what is their silicon going to be sensitive to? Is it going to be dominated by reflections? Is it crosstalk? You know, what what is number one in terms of their problem, and how can we uh, introduce solutions into our product that helps with that? And then, of course, there's the industry standards and industry uh, forums that we're members of, where TE really takes a strong leadership role in terms of coming with a big voice. We attend the meetings. We bring data. We talk about what can be accomplished, what's the time frame that we can do that. We do that through simulations, we do that through measured data, and then we have this back and forth with the silicon folks, and then with the end users, the guy who's making the switch or the server, he has physical needs that he has to meet, and so we're looking at, okay, what's the connectivity, what's the transmit, what's the receive, what's the distance that the the end user needs, and how do we bring this together for an industry-wide solution? But working with this ecosystem of partners, then we come back internal to TE, we circle the wagons, put our heads down and think about, okay, what are we gonna do within our connector or within the interface between our connector and the printed circuit board or a copper cable, and how are we going to achieve those objectives? You know, and, and then we make, when we develop these solutions, then of course, you know, the folks that are watching the podcast We have to figure out how to uh, communicate um, the design rules, the guidance, and you know that's a big part of what Justin's team does. Is there, you know, once we develop a product, the game's not over. We now have to make it because it's different. It's much harder now, and we have to help our customers in terms of training training sessions, um, application development tools, um, routing guides, things like that so that then they know how to make this leap to 100 gig as well. So it really um, takes the whole industry in order to make this happen. 
Uh, but we like to think that we're kind of on the, the underpinning of it. If we can't solve these basic copper problems, then the rest of it really isn't going to matter. So it's that constant innovation that we're driving for. Yeah. Um, Justin, what kind of sort of next gen materials are needed to to step into this territory? Sure. So, you know, on the board side, certainly the next gen materials are, like I said, a movement away from the FR4 based mm -hmm. to a PPO type of resin. And so that's a kind of a next gen resin that's lower loss. It's also lower dielectric constant. If we talk about, you know, FR4 generally, we might say it has a dielectric constant of four. Mm -hmm. We're now looking at materials that are down around three. And so that's in the, in the printed circuit board itself. In connectors, what we see is kind of a similar trend, although a different family of plastics is used instead of uh, PCB laminate type materials, we're using injection molded um, thermoplastics. Mm -hmm. And so in the past, maybe you've seen products made out of nylon, the, the current charge is really lots of high-end engineering polymers like LCP, which is a liquid, liquid crystal polymer. Mm -hmm. And we see a similar trend where um, resin manufacturers are making lower DK plastics that are lower loss as well. And we find that we really have to do and understand a lot about the resins and the materials that we're using to create molded plastic components. Hmm. Then on the metal side, you know, not only are we using high high performance copper alloys that are very springy, which allow us to really create a very dense connector interface. We also find that in order to get better shielding and better crosstalk performance, we're doing a lot of molded metallized and whether molded metallized components, whether that be with the conductive plastic technology or something where we're applying a really thin metallized coating to an actual mm -hmm. connector component itself. In the cable arena, we see also, you know, new materials in terms of different insulations as well as different insulation technologies. And so in the cable arena, we're pursuing new extrusion technologies that allow us greater design flexibility and tolerance control of the cables that we manufacture. And that really also works to increase reach, increase density, and keep our loss low in the, in the cables that we make. Interesting. So there's really a multifaceted kind of approach. Um, every little bit helps, and you know, we really have to use a lot of tools to do that work as well. Well, taking that framework as sort of a jumping off point, um, Nathan, can you talk um, to our audience about specific products, um, you know, maybe relative to connectors or things that um, help solve these problems and, and get folks where they need to be? Sure. Yeah, let's take a look. I actually brought a, a few props with me today. So, you know, customers design equipment to standard form factors or standard sizes. So they're physically very large panels that they use, and they have a number of devices that they have to interconnect from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. And we talked about 100 gigabits is going to have a lot of challenge with reach or insertion loss from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. And so some of the things that we've done, and, and Justin just kind of touched on this a little bit, is we've developed cable solutions that can be used inside the equipment from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. So here we have a, a very large high bandwidth switch. Here we have IO ports or potentially from a switch to a backplane connector and we use these internal cable assemblies instead of PCB routing so that we overcome the loss. The, the twin axe yeah. cabling has a much lower loss than the, than the PCB technology and so we can virtually double or even more increase the reach of the, the signaling by going to solutions like this. Some of the other, uh, so this is our sliver product. We call this sliver, it's, it has a connector at, at the one end and then another sliver connector on the other end from point A to point B. So it's one of the techniques that we're developing to bring to market to solve 100 gigabit solutions. And it's actually being broadly adopted even today at 50 gigabit. Hmm. Interesting. In addition, folks want, so these are what we call IO connectors. This is where people would plug in fiber optics or TE's copper cables. I don't know if I'm holding this in the right place, but um, so these are plugging into here. And folks, again, don't want to transition through the printed circuit board due to loss. So we've developed 
an interconnect solution that allows them to connect from the outside world directly into the equipment with a separable connection while at the same time optimizing for insertion loss or getting back the reach that they had lost. Mm -hmm. Over here at the switch or the processor, as we mentioned, when the customer increases, when the, when the silicon partners increase the data rate, they also increase the aggregate bandwidth. So now these chips are getting larger and larger, hmm. and so they can't direct attach them with BGA technology anymore. The product is physically too large, and so we're developing socketing solutions so that these can be socketed, but those sockets now have to support 100 gigabits per second. And so, you know, we're developing that technology and delivering it um, in a prototype phase now for our customers for use at 100 gigabits per second. We talked about density, and typically customers will have two rows of I.O. ports in a product, and now what they're asking us to do, because that, that switch chip back here is doubling its aggregate bandwidth, so they're now asking us to go to solutions where we have four rows of connectivity at the front panel. So you can imagine where we interface to the printed circuit board. You know, Justin talked about the challenges of vias and how those vias don't create crosstalk to each other. Now, you know, we're going to develop this connector. We're going to ship it. But the guy who's laying out this printed circuit board, he's got a real problem because he's got a connector up here and a connector here that are all going into vias. And so we have to give him that solution. We have to tell him where to put signal vias that create isolation. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, uh, isolation vias, uh, where to put the signal vias, and how to do that in a way that so they don't have to reinvent the wheel at right. every one of our customers. So that's part of our task is to enable them to take this highly complex connector and put it onto their board in an effective uh, problem-solving way. And now I, I kind of gave the high level definition of all that, but it, it's really hard. Yeah, so <laughs> what's under the hood, Justin? <laughs> <laughs> what's under the hood? So certainly in the PCB level, you know, uh, Nathan did a lot of talking about how we, we would, we help customers lay out how a connector or a cable interfaces with a PCB. Two of the big things there that are important are, you know, the strides that the industry has made in PCB manufacturer technology. And so ma most of the structures that you make, just like when you make a car, it's based on tolerance, right? The better you can control every component that goes into the assembly, the smaller you can make it without having failures. Mm -hmm. And so in the PCB itself, what we see is smaller vias with smaller drill bits that are more tightly plated. And one of the big things we see is how do we control stubs? And so in printed circuit boards, we have uh, a stub, which is where you have a via of a set length and you have one, you have a trace coming in in the middle of it. Maybe let's say it goes up to the top. You have this stub effect that's kind of like an antenna. And we see a lot of different technologies used to improve that stub, whether we make it smaller with a dual diameter or we counterbore it. Um, there's a lot of different technologies that go into that. Inside the connector, then, we also go through the same amount of miniaturization of, you know, bad electrical actors, whether that's making structures smaller or better shielded, um, while at the same time increasing the density. Nathan talked a little bit about um, what he sees in some of the I.O. and the, the near board um, products, but also in board to board, you know, one thing we see is if we were to look at 25 gig product, we kind of have something that was pretty small, right? And a lot mm -hmm. of this original, what we call, this is our Strata Whisper board to board connector. This is kind of about the average size. And what you can see is we've applied a lot of this metalized um, molded components in here. So this is our 25 gig offering. If you were to go up and see what the market trends would look like for 112, you end up seeing something really big, right? Mm -hmm. Something that is larger in square area and also larger in terms of the amount of signals it can carry as we try to get to higher aggregate bandwidths. Also interesting, you know, we've lowered some costs by more smartly applying the metalized conductive um, plastic components. You'll see a little bit less shininess in this new one, hmm. but really this is a little cheaper and also um, four times the bandwidth. You know, interesting. Or signal, signal capability. So a lot, of, a lot of new technology going on there in terms of 
how we integrate our products with PCBs, and then also how we, we make the connectors themselves. Well, my gosh, I feel like I've been drinking from the fire hose, you guys, and good for you for doing all this incredible work. Um, Nathan, in summary, I'm thinking about our audience here and like, what's the takeaway here for, for, you know, for the industry, but also for our listeners, like, what is the takeaway and, you know, kind of summarizing our discussion here today? Yeah. So, um, you know, there's a danger of repeating myself a little bit, um, you know, when we started 25 gigabit, we knew it was going to be really hard, but we knew where the problem areas were going to be, and we went after those. And then we repeated that at 50 gig. At 100 gig, we weren't sure exactly how far we were going to be able to go because every speed jump, we lose a little bit of margin. Um, and we are now at the point with 100 gigabit where we can um, loudly communicate to our, our partners and our customers that the solutions will exist, they will be robust, and we will be here to help them with that introduction. And you know, when, when we talk about the solutions, things are gonna change a little bit at 100 gigabits per second. We're gonna take some of those traces out of the print circuit board, and we're gonna use our uh, specifically developed 100 gigabit twin X cabling to do some jumpering inside the box. Outside of the box, where they're connecting from a server to a switch, you know, we're going to provide them a, gr a, a brand new cable solution that's new technology from the ground up that was developed specifically for 100 gigabits per second. But they're still going to get that level of performance and that level of service that they've come to expect, whether it's design aids or whether it's the quality of the product and standing behind it as they're uh, implementing that product. At 100 gigabits, we talked about the problems with loss and we talked about the problems with density what we didn't talk about is that all of that overcoming the loss and over and achieving the density is bringing a lot of thermal dissipation hmm. so a whole new frontier for te is we're now solving our customers thermal problems when they put that big line card together and they're overcoming all those losses, they're dissipating a lot of power, a lot more than they ever have in the past. Mm. And so we're developing thermal solutions that go on to our connectors that help them manage the thermal in the box. So not only is 100 gig gonna come to market, and it is gonna be robust, but it's gonna be a little bit different than what they've seen in the past. And they're gonna get different um, product solutions from TE in terms of the areas we're gonna support them, where it wasn't really a market need before thermal management was there but it was not a screaming your hair's on fire kind of problem and now it is and so we're bringing the thermal solutions along with the connectivity solutions to market and we're going to do that in a way that we're going to roll that out so that our customers have the tools and the know-how to implement these things and then we're going to start worrying about the next data rate after that because <laughs> there's no end in sight and you know we want to be around for a long time and so we're just going to have to like i said up our game and solve new problems but really good news on 100 gig get ready it's coming and it's going to be it's going to work it's going to work well that's fabulous well a huge congratulations to both of you and to te for really staying ahead of the curve right you're you're really paving the way for tomorrow's um technology and ability for us to you know do all the things we love more right uh, online yeah, and exactly. whatnot so congratulations to both of you congratulations to te thank you so much to both of you for sharing all this information with this fascinating topic and kudos to you guys <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much um, thanks, thanks for your time Judy. Thanks. thank you to our listeners i hope this has been interesting and encouraging to you know that the 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 future is bright and 100 gigabits per second is coming um i was actually introduced to these two fine gentlemen through our um through octopart which is an altium 
um, brand company. And I, through your Active Bomb and online and the Octopart website, you can find TE products and learn more about them and see their slash sheets there and, and learn more about them. And I encourage you to do that. And I will put those links in the show notes for you so you don't have to go hunting. So thanks for joining us today. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation with Nathan and Justin. We'll see you next time. Until then, remember to always stay on track. 